critically injured patient arrives at University of California Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, one of the busiest emergency rooms in the country. Air ambulance paramedics have stabilized the patient during the helicopter flight with oxygen and fluids. For the medical team, time is of the essence. This could be a case of life or death. I'm a doctor. I'm trained to save lives. To me, death is a defeat. How can I turn my back on something, no matter how hopeless it seems? Practicing emergency medicine is like being on the front lines of war. We've been around for thousands of years, and we've been at the battlefront for thousands of years as well. Right here. Awesome. Right Hippocrates, when he was talking about how you can really and truly develop the, ex the uh, expertise as a physician, well, he said you need to go to the battlefield. Well, what he was talking about was people providing acute and emergency care at the battlefront. And that was, that's an ER doc. 100 million Americans will visit an emergency room this year. That is one out of every three people. Some will go for minor problems. Others will have a life-threatening injury or illness. Hey, 138 over 118. Okay. In an extreme trauma situation, the team uses the latest in medical technology. From monitoring devices that provide information on blood pressure, oxygen levels, and heart rhythms of the patient, to intravenous medications like reperfusing enzymes, D5W, and heparin. Don't move, this did. Ouch. There you go. Once the patient is stable, more detailed diagnostic work can begin. It's controlled chaos. Believe it or not, we really do know what we're doing. Even amidst all the helter-skelter that's going on, there is a plan. And we know exactly what's going on with everybody at any given time. We better know what we're doing with all this technology. Okay. Okay. It's right here, Bonnie. Right, we need to get ready to start going upstairs. This patient has been stabilized and is now on his way to the operating room for the next phase of treatment. In emergency medicine, the most severe injuries are labeled level one traumas. A level one trauma facility must have a full surgical team available 24 hours a day. And there are specific criteria for the types of cases that are taken to a level one hospital. Well, the whole idea is instability. You know, those patients who are injured seriously enough to have significant, you know, uh, blood loss, to have uh, be in a life-threatening situation. Any penetrating wounds, either stab wounds or gunshot wounds of the chest or abdomen, multiple long bone fractures, patients with severe head injuries, um, head injuries with loss of uh, consciousness. The treatment of patients with severe trauma injuries has evolved over thousands of years. Archaeological sites dating back to the Stone Age reveal bodies that showed some type of medical attention. I will argue that clearly emergency medicine is the oldest specialty. When the first caveman dropped a rock on his foot, or when flesh met flesh, when flesh met tooth, when flesh met a rock, and there was a laceration, an injury, and one of that caveman's compatriots tried to do something about that injury, that was the first emergency medicine practitioner. Prehistoric man treated wounds with plasters of plant and animal extracts, and then covered them with bandages. There is some research that theorizes that early man set broken limbs and reset dislocated joints. Well, I would think that Amongst the first injuries you see are orthopedic injuries. Fractures are pretty obvious, even without x-rays. Obviously, the subtle fractures aren't, but the knowledge of when and how to splint people uh, while they heal probably is very rudimentary knowledge. By 1200 BC, in ancient Greece, wounded men were taken to the temple of Asclepius, the son of the god Apollo and a mortal woman. The patients would go to a sleeping room in the temple where it was believed they would be healed through a divinely inspired dream.
The legendary medical teacher Hippocrates traced his origins back to descendants of Asclepius. Hippocrates embraced the art of observation and medical diagnosis and warned his students to first do no harm. Divine intervention for healing purposes was frequently invoked in ancient Greece, but some concrete medical knowledge did develop on the battlefield. Injured soldiers were given a drink of opium mixed with wine to kill their pain, and the wounds themselves were covered with sap or honey to stop the bleeding. But it was the Roman Empire that first employed full-time medical personnel to travel with their legions and administer to injured soldiers during battle. In the Middle Ages, medical practitioners developed the use of the sling bandage for arm injuries and weight and pulley traction devices for leg fractures. But the invention of gunpowder brought with it a new set of problems in the care of severe penetrating wounds. Some of the management of wounds in the Middle Ages is pretty horrifying because they thought that you had to cauterize every wound and then they would wait for the wound to get infected. Amboise Paré, a French surgeon in the 1500s, revolutionized the treatment of wounds by using tourniquets to stop the bleeding. He simply cleaned and wrapped the injured area with gauze and let the body heal itself naturally. This procedure preempted a lot of amputations due to unnecessary infections. New techniques for treating a variety of emergency cases continued in the 16th century. Physicians at that time developed a crude bellows to pump air into a person who had stopped breathing. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and CPR would not be used until the 1950s. During the French Revolution, Dominique Jean Loret realized that time was a crucial factor in treating wounded soldiers. He devised the concept of the ambulance volante, a version of the horse and buggy that would transport surgeons to the front lines. When civil war was declared in America in the mid-1800s, neither side was prepared with a strategy for evacuating wounded soldiers. Some were left helpless on the battlefield for weeks. Well, the Civil War was as horrifying an experience in disaster medicine that this country has ever seen. And when you consider the sheer numbers of casualties in the major battles of the Civil War, it simply was overwhelming to the medical care at the time. Jonathan Letterman was brought in to head up the Medical Corps for the Union and he organized teams of ambulances for transporting the injured and a system of dressing stations in nearby field hospitals. But the field surgeons performed their amputations under extremely unsanitary conditions. Instruments and sponges were reused without cleaning them between patients. And the surgeries were performed on patients who were conscious. At that time, we didn't have much to do for an injury other than amputation. And we didn't have a lot of anesthesia with which to amputate. So there were a lot of people who probably died from the, the painful experience of having a, a leg amputated. It did improve the surgical technique of many of the, of the battlefield surgeons. They could amputate a, a leg in less than a minute. But that wasn't necessarily the best way to, to do it. And I think that what we learned from that war the hard way was that we need a better way of getting casualties to medical care and better medical care. The hundreds of thousands of casualties during the Civil War caused the medical profession to begin to look for new ways to provide emergency services. But in the late 1800s, there were only three permanent hospitals in the United States. And it wasn't until World War II that there were any significant technological advances in acute care procedures. The practice of on-scene emergency medicine was developing during World War II. It was the first time doctors and medics on the front lines gave blood and other fluid therapies to wounded soldiers. But until the 1950s, Amputation was still the only answer for most of the trauma encountered on the battlefield.
It wasn't really until uh, Korea and uh, uh, the latter half of this century that we developed techniques of being able to work with arterial injuries and limb salvage. That was one of the most important advances during the Korean conflict. Well, knowledge comes from a variety of uh, resources, and it is grimly ironic that some of our major advances in the management of, of death and disease is from military medicine. But while the level of military medicine progressed for the first half of the 20th century, emergency care on the home front had fallen behind. During that period of time, it was pretty dismal. And the reason is that we did not have an enormous amount of civilian trauma. We didn't have a really great highway system. We didn't have an enormous number of automobile accidents, although we had them. Many of the major accidents that occurred uh, just simply killed people because there was no way to get them from where they were being injured to a place that could take care of them. Many of the medical problems, the non-traumatic problems, were cared for only late in their course inside of a hospital. And they were not cared for in an emergency department because doctors still made house calls. Through the 1960s, emergency medicine in America was poor in its quality and small in its scope. But several factors converged to bring about a significant change in its practice. The thing that resulted in emergency medicine development was the passage of Medicaid and Medicare. Because in years prior to the advent of health insurance, most of the people who used emergency rooms were indigent. Or conversely, since they had no previous contact with the uh, physicians involved in the emergency practice uh, were often hard to collect money from. So private hospitals did not have emergency rooms. According to studies conducted by Dr. Blaisdell, the need for emergency medicine changed drastically as a result of the hippie movement and the protests of the Vietnam War. These protests escalated and brought with them paradoxically violence. Now the violence occurred because in parallel with uh, the development of the high Ashbury concept, hard drugs were introduced into the city of San Francisco. The drug trade brought violence into our American cities that we never had before. We know on the basis of our statistics at San Francisco General Hospital where we had all the injuries and so forth that crimes of violence were rare. One or two a week in the city of San Francisco prior to 1968. All of a sudden overnight crimes of violence doubled and they doubled again, and they doubled again. And shootings and stabbings were rampant. They were bombs set off in the police department. Downtown Detroit was essentially burned down. Uh, and that precipitated a whole reorganization of services because instead of being an occasional thing, now injuries were a regular thing. The need for more effective emergency services inspired a group of concerned doctors to start the American College of Emergency Physicians to train doctors for their work in the emergency department. Prior to this initiative, the doctors staffing these departments were ill-equipped to deal with the majority of the problems that presented themselves at their door. One night it would be a surgeon, one night it would be a urologist, one night it would be a radiologist. Well, and in the private sector, many of these specialists said, look, I don't know anything about traumatic care. I don't know anything about medical problems. I'm a psychiatrist or I'm a pathologist. It doesn't make sense for me to be here as well as it's bad for patient care. Emergency medicine became a bona fide specialty in 1979. These newly trained specialists are career professionals in emergency room medicine and with the help of new technology are able to perform more specific treatments than in the past. We've got all the technology that's available in the, in the hospital at our fingertips here in the emergency department for cardiac monitoring. We put those little sticky things on your chest and we then connect it to a special machine that will monitor everything from the heartbeat that you have to your blood pressure to the amount of oxygen in your blood. So we try to use all that stuff to our best advantage to take good care of you. The electrocardiograph records electrical changes in the heart and is used to monitor and diagnose any abnormalities. 
The first electrocardiograph required the patient to place his hands and feet in buckets of water to conduct the current to a galvanometer for measurement. It was invented by the Dutch physiologist Willem Einhoven in 1901. Another vital piece of the emergency medical care puzzle is blood pressure. In 1896, Italian physician Riva Ricci developed the sphygmomanometer to measure the force of blood flowing from the heart. Today, through the use of a pulse oximeter, doctors can find out much more information about the circulation of the blood and its oxygen levels. The device measures light absorption through the blood vessels in the finger to gather its information. Wilhelm Rentgen's discovery of X-ray technology in the late 1890s helped physicians see for themselves any fractures or foreign objects that may have lodged internally in the body. Since the 1970s, emergency doctors also used computerized axial tomography to get a faster and more comprehensive look at patients that helps in making a more rapid diagnosis. CT scan is a special type of x-ray that cuts patients like a loaf of bread and you can identify specific injuries uh, with CT scanning. At first uh, and greatest value initially was in evaluating head injury. The head was a black box and you really have standard x-rays could not really tell you anything about the nature of the injury inside the head. With the advent of the CT scan, all of a sudden, you could see everything was going on inside the head. See small hemorrhages, major hemorrhages. I'd say that was a great advance. Subsequently applied to the abdomen, where you could diagnose liver injuries and spleen injuries without having to wait until the patient bled enough to drop their blood count to tell you that there was serious internal hemorrhage. The emergency department staff must be ready to handle all of the cases all of the time. They are trained in the art of triage, or sorting out the most serious cases from the ones that can be handled in a less urgent manner. The patients come to us and one of three things happens. They either are treated and we send them home, they're admitted upstairs, or they die. Just one of three things. And our goal is to get them out of the emergency department as quickly as possible. It's very exciting. We see what I love to call the soup to nuts of medicine. It's a little bit of everything. We see people from the beginning of life to the end of life. Level one traumas pull the staff of the emergency department together. The surgical resident heads up the team, along with other doctors, registered nurses, a radiology technician, and respiratory therapist. The charge nurse coordinates from the sidelines. It's what I call the full court press, and everybody is there to stabilize the patient. In emergency medicine, I'm constantly interacting with the paramedics who bring the patient in. I'm constantly interacting with the, the uh, respiratory technicians and the x-ray technicians, as well as with the consulting services to whom we're admitting patients. So you have to learn how to get along with people, and doctors have never been taught that very well. But in emergency medicine, it's critical. This patient was attacked and is now unconscious. His um, chest wall is stable. His breast sacs are equal bilaterally. He's nasally intubated to the right nary. The trauma team works together to try to get a complete assessment of all the patient's life-threatening injuries and get him the treatment that he needs as quickly as possible. The vast majority of these patients were healthy people minding their own business until in a split second they've had this uh, devastating injury and sometimes we can restore them back to complete function sometimes we can't so I think that you know our goal is uh, try to keep get them back as whole as they were before this injury when appropriate the doctors and nurses do try to get information directly from the patient <laughs> 
but sometimes that is impossible. So we're going to give him a three on motor. That's an important attribute of an emergency physician to immediately establish a human contact with a patient who, no matter how trivial the problem, probably has some fear and needs some reassurance. But there are times when the golden rule does not apply in medicine and you just have to do things to people because that's what's going to keep them alive. Then uh, normal tone is decreased but he's been paralyzed. Emergency medicine is a highly stressful specialty and the doctors and nurses who practice it often suffer from burnout. I'll tell you where, where I think it stems from is is the intensity uh, of their work style, if, if you will. Always being the one to deal with the cardiac arrest or always being the one to deal with the life-threatening choking or massive bleeding. And that takes its, its emotional toll when you're dealing with that all the time. I think particularly when we have a, a, a child or, or a baby or that stays with everybody. And it's very, very, uh, very hard to get through. And many times, uh, People have to take a shift off to be able to deal with that. So I think it's the nature of what, what we do uh, and the intensity of it at times and, and the life and death. Emergency medicine is not an exact science. It borrows from other areas of medicine and applies the necessary procedures as called for. By and large, most of the technology that we use and the medications that we use are used because they have been developed for uh, other areas of expertise, the cardiologists, uh, the neurologists, the surgeons, and we get to take the best of all their technologies and use them in the acute care setting uh, in the emergency department. Since 1979, the physicians in the emergency department are qualified to perform more technical procedures than ever before. If it looks as if you're severely depleted of oxygen, we give our first drug of choice, oxygen, because oxygen is a drug. If that's not working, then we will put a tube in um, called an endotracheal tube, and we will then put you on a ventilator, and that will be for your, we will sit there with a bag, and we'll squeeze it, and we'll force oxygen into your lungs. The intubation procedure consists of inserting a tube through a laryngoscope into a patient's windpipe. The technique was brought to America from Europe in 1880. The emergency department is not going to go away. I think that it requires sophisticated equipment and technology to support it. It requires people who are trained, people who want to be there, people who know how to be there. And my dream is that someday in this country, you won't go into an emergency department anywhere in the country and be met by anything other than a resident trained graduate in emergency medicine. We're not there yet. St. Vincent's Hospital is a level one trauma center in New York City. Its reputation as one of the top emergency rooms goes back to its beginnings. The Sisters of Charity started the hospital in 1849. Their first emergency ward opened in 1890. The hospital's original location was in the West Village section of New York. In 1849, the area was more like a bustling seaport village than the big city that we know today. And the hospital's patients were mostly newly arrived immigrants. The Sisters of Charity were initially assisted by eminent physicians in the New York area, most notably Dr. Valentine Mott, called the father of American surgery. And while St. Vincent's had the assistance of some of the greatest minds in medicine at the time, the critical care techniques can only be described as crude at best. They didn't have developed anesthesia. So they used alcohol sometimes to anesthetize or numb the patient um, before surgery. Sometimes they had to do amputations if there was a very bad wound to a limb. They used leeches. In 1875, the Sisters of St. Vincent's pioneered the establishment of the New York Board of Health to help in the fight against infectious diseases that spread throughout the city.
They think there were a lot of standards that um, kind of grew out of the everyday practice that emanated um, from the hospital. One of my favorite stories is during the 1850s. This was before the days of Lister, who discovered microbes in the lab. The, the doctors came in in their street clothes and operated on patients, and the sisters insisted that the doctors at their hospital wash their hands when they came in. The infection rate and the deaths due to post-operative infections was far lower at the Sisters Hospital. St. Vincent's Hospital was the second hospital in New York to use a horse-drawn ambulance in 1870, starting one of the oldest traditions of emergency medical services in the country. I believe Bellevue Hospital had the first horse-drawn ambulance by history, but we were soon after. Uh, uh, it wasn't like a Kentucky Derby, but we followed quickly with our horse-drawn ambulance. Uh, and they progressed over the years. St. Vincent's did have the first motorized ambulance in 1900. It was a Model T Ford, I think. Um, it's amusing that that was a big step forward uh, when we look back to say there was a motorized ambulance. In fact, the people during those days put it aside after a few months because they found it less reliable than the horse that they could just go out and jump, jump on and the horse would always run, but the mechanical uh, motorized wouldn't always turn over. St. Vincent's was called to help save the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire of 1911. And in 1912, the hospital provided beds to over 100 survivors of the Titanic disaster. Their medical teams provided on-scene emergency care and ambulance transport in 1945 when a military plane crashed into the Empire State Building. In the late 1940s, St. Vincent's developed what would become one of the premier trauma care facilities in New York, thanks to Sister Loretta Bernard, who ran the hospital from 1939 until 1960. She um, recognized St. Vincent's potential she recruited physicians of worldwide fame. Uh, so we had a neurosurgeon, uh, an eye surgeon, a head and neck surgeon, and um, a general surgeon. Sister Margareta Brock has been at St. Vincent's for over 60 years. She acts as an advocate for patients and their families in the emergency department. When the World Trade Building was bombed, I shall never forget the number of patients we got. Children were lost because the parents were taken in the ambulance too quickly, or they were in the elevator waiting to be picked up by their parents. And that was a, a very traumatic experience for the patients, but thank God we could really and truly um, substitute for a parent on many occasions. Because of her long-term experience administering care, Sister Margareta has an expanded view of the people who come to St. Vincent's for help and the purpose of the emergency department. There's many stories you could tell about the homeless. The big thing is many times they just need support. They need clothing, they need something to eat. And that's part of emergency care regardless of what anybody says. An integral part of emergency medicine is the transporting of patients to the hospital. The faster the victim gets to the hospital, the more chance he or she has for survival. The timely delivery of injured parties goes back to the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon came up with the idea of transporting his wounded off the battlefield in hot air balloons to a place where they could receive medical attention. He started a balloon factory in 1794 for that purpose, but never actually used one in battle. In the Vietnam War, casualties were assessed on the spot, and the survivors were carried to the nearest evacuation hospital for rapid treatment. Doctors and medics staffed the helicopters and began administering care during the transport. The concept of stabilizing the patient en route to the hospital was introduced in the United States in 1969. 30, 40 years ago, we had uh, 
gurney jockeys or ambulance drivers who would just arrive on scene, throw a patient on a stretcher in the back of a Cadillac, and off the way they go to the hospital without any real care being administered to that patient. In the 1960s, ambulances were provided through mortuary companies. These vehicles were actually hearses with sirens and a paint job. So you know what? Gee, how wonderful it was. There wasn't a whole lot of emergency care provided, and if you had a bad outcome, they could just kind of take you right in that same vehicle and bring you to the local mortuaries, all the same people. In 1968, Dr. J. Frank Pantridge of Belfast, Ireland realized that people were dying of heart attacks because they were not transported to the hospital quickly enough and because they were not getting care en route. So this Dr. Pantridge said, you know what? We're going to put doctors on ambulances, and when we get someone that sounds like they have a heart attack, we're going to go there. Pantridge and his partner, John Getty, set up a vehicle equipped with a battery-operated portable defibrillator, endotracheal tubes, and suction apparatus, and a supply of drugs that would normally be available in a coronary care hospital unit. They used a shortwave radio for communications. Their work reduced the amount of fatalities from heart attacks. Of the first 13 patients they visited, 10 survived. Dr. William Grace of St. Vincent's Hospital went over to Ireland and came back with a similar plan for the ambulances in New York City. It was the first mobile coronary care unit ambulance in the United States. And really, I'm going to say selfishly for Dr. Grace and St. Vincent's, became the model for paramedic manned ambulances in this country. In the last 30 years, paramedic training has grown to include certain procedures that previously could only be done in a hospital setting. Once on the scene, the first priority is to physically stabilize the patient. This boy was hit by a car while riding his bike. The paramedics use a cervical collar and backboard to support his neck and back. At times, the paramedics will start an intravenous line to provide medication on the way to the hospital. It's gonna feel like a small little bee sting, okay? The paramedics also carry a life pack which includes a defibrillator for extreme heart attack emergencies and a portable electrocardiograph to monitor the patient's heart rate. The readout is transmitted through telemetry and the paramedics use the telephone to inform the hospital of the condition of the incoming patient. This patient's chief complaint today is out of chest pain. Pretty sharp, substernal pain. Uh, underneath his left breast, radiating down his left arm and into his left jaw. Advances in communication systems have helped to bridge the crucial time factor in extreme emergency situations. Less than 200 years ago in the 19th century, town criers walked the streets to announce any emergencies that occurred. The invention of the telephone in 1875 made it possible to call a doctor directly who would then come to your house. Telephones became common in households in the 1950s and people would call the police if there was an accident or other type of trauma. The first 911 emergency system was introduced in Haleyville, Alabama on February 16, 1968. 911, this is Jan, what are you reporting? Today, the 911 system is a countrywide organized network that dispatches the ambulances and fire departments that are closest to the scene. The 911 operators who answer the calls are trained in emergency services and procedures. Emergency medical dispatcher training uh, has increased significantly in the past 10 years and uh, I feel it's provided and given us in the field 
a greater support and backbone for us to provide our job in the field. Better communications, quicker response times, and medical care on the scene are all factors that come together to create more efficient pre-hospital care. And there is the human element as well. Do you know where you are right now? Where? No? Okay, I want you to just sit back and relax, okay? We're gonna take you on over to the hospital, all right? It's very difficult not to become personally involved uh, with some of the patients and, and interactions we have with our community at times. But then again, I do feel that we do have a job to do and a service to provide. And once emotions and, and feelings become involved with patient care, to an extent it can interfere with, the, with the, the proper and effective delivery of what is truly best for that patient in that situation. For those injuries and illnesses that do not require a call to 911 or a trip to the emergency room, patients now have the option of going to urgent care centers. These centers have cropped up around the country over the last 20 years. They are walk-in clinics that can handle almost any type of medical problem, except the worst trauma cases. But they haven't lightened the load in the emergency rooms. There are urgent care centers that were designed to try to be lower in cost to provide quote, faster care, unquote. But I think most people are still more comfortable coming to an emergency department. And it's hard to define what is a true emergency and what is urgent, but not emergent. And so when people come, they invariably think they're having one of the worst problems of their life, even though it may be just a severe sore throat or it may be a little dry cough. For you, that may be the emergency of a lifetime. And I, and I think that urgent care centers have been convenience centers. But just as 7-Elevens have not reduced the business of the major uh, grocery store chains, I don't think urgent care centers have affected the workload of the emergency department. The future of emergency medicine may be found on the highest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest. The Extreme Everest Expedition is in its second year. Its purpose is to uncover secrets to the human body's functioning in reaction to extreme and adverse conditions. Researchers from NASA and Yale University are conducting experiments with new medical devices and telemedicine. The Everest doctors gather the data from the climbers on the mountain and then transmit it back to Yale for instant evaluation. The impact of these experiments will soon be felt in emergency departments around the world. We'll be monitoring some of their basic vital signs, heart rate, temperature, movement, in addition to following their exact location through a GPS monitor. The doctors on Everest have set up a makeshift emergency room in one of the tents at base camp. They have most of the equipment necessary to handle any medical emergency short of a major trauma. They will certainly be able to provide a good level of care in a hands-on sense, but we are on a daily and sometimes twice daily basis going to be in communication with that medical team and review the clinical cases and discuss and decide what other treatment plans could be uh, instituted. The base camp physicians perform fendoscopic examinations on the climbers to look behind the retina. Much can be learned about the effects of living at high altitude by checking the blood flow behind the eye. There are a lot of vision problems up there at altitude and um, surprisingly, as I said, there's fairly little data or information on what to do about it. The Everest team uses digital microscopes to analyze the red and white blood cells and the changes that occur when the body is exposed to the rigors of being in the low oxygen environment. Blow, 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 blow. The Everest team uses a digital spirometer to measure how much air is in the lungs and how difficult it is for the climbers to breathe. Very good. And they use an iStat, which is used in trauma facilities to get a fast reading on the blood's properties. Once the blood sample has been placed in the iStat, it gives the pH 
percentages of oxygen saturation, potassium and ionized calcium, and the hematic rate to the doctors in less than 90 seconds. A complete blood count used to take more than 30 minutes in a hospital. The instruments and monitoring devices are small and lightweight. Every morning before they begin their trek, the Everest climbers are hooked up to the leads that stick onto their chest, much like the electrocardiograph. The monitors are carried in a small biopack that the climbers wear around their waist. The climbers also swallow a large pill that records their internal temperature for up to 30 hours. The pill is a capsule that contains a tiny radio transmitter. Mm. Ah, lunch! <laughs> The electrical components in the pill and the biopack send the data to a computer at base camp. And that information is then transmitted via a satellite system to Yale in real time. The doctors in New Haven, Connecticut scheduled their rounds accordingly. The folks at Mount Everest will have two B phones, they're called, which provide 64 kilobit per second of uh, data transmission capability. That is enough to provide with reasonable video and uh, audio as well as transmitting some of these larger data files. Once that gets up into the satellite system, then it comes back down and we'll be transmitting mostly through the ISDN types of technologies as well as using the internet and doing some testing with the Internet 2 system as well. The results of this research will one day play a definitive role on the front lines of emergency medicine. This is related to emergency medicine in the sense that emergency medicine is a very, very acute way that we practice medicine. And the only thing different between emergency medicine and day-to-day and -day medicine is the order of magnitude of the injury or disease and time. The tempo is much faster. Therefore, technologies that we have been developing in the past that we use in doctors' offices, as we make them smaller, and we make them instantly available to, to acquire the information. Therefore, they can migrate immediately to the emergency room. What we're really trying to look forward to in the future is how do you detect what's going on with a person's body? How do you decide what is the real true problem there? And then as importantly as anything, how do you do something about it without that person necessarily having to come into some type of healthcare facility? For those who will visit an emergency room, it will most likely be a scary, if not traumatic experience. But with the expertise of hospital staff and the latest in diagnostic devices and treatments, that visit could be the best trip of their life. And I feel comfortable saying this, uh, and I, because I really believe it. The trauma systems, the systems we have for injury prevention that we're just developing now, when you actually come into an emergency department, you can feel comfortable and very confident that there are protocols and there are practices that have been put in place that you will be taken care of. But despite advances in technology and trauma care procedures, the fate of an emergency room patient still rests in the hands of a doctor. <laughs>